safe on Tonys and Oscars and Emmys and Grammys. There's no red carpet because they're home in their jammies. From Melrose Place to Broadway to Janeway and her crew. Let Seth and James bring all the stars to you. Anywho. They're entertaining everyone, so who's gonna grouse? Just sit right back and you'll hear some tales on Star. The singing voice of Anastasia oh, in honor right. of Clary Aaron. <laughs> the love of this cow is singing a song by Dana Rowe and Scott Logsdon. I hey guys, it. welcome to um, Stars in the House. What yes. is Stars in the House? <laughs> I don't remember. You don't remember? You don't remember we've been doing this literally since mid March. Oh, this is bad exposition. This is like we have this, what? Did we start? This is like you making fun of that whole what is it? The Judy Garland show. All right, Ethel Merman, Merman, you happen to be here, right. and we have your orchestrations. Um, <laughs> anywho, Stars in the House began in March. We're raising money for the Actress Fund, yes, which is a misnomer. Misnomer is also my drag name. Anyway, um, Stars uh, Actress Fund is for anybody in the arts, actress, singer, dancer, behind the scenes, meaning ushers, tech people, stage managers, uh, makeup artists, casting directors, and not all just of that. yeah, not just Broadway across the country and right. television and film. So best boys, key grips, whatever you do, you can go to the Actors Fund and say, I can't pay my rent, can't buy groceries, can't pay my medical bills, they will give you the cash. If you need help in the Actors Fund, get thee to actorsfund.org. If there you, you can, wow, that was good. And if you they have a help. great program, every artist insured, because yeah. people are losing their insurance each month yes, as they lose their weeks that they had accumulated in whatever shows they were working on. Um, so they've got a great program to help you not only help pay for the insurance if you need it, but also to help you find the health insurance policy. So yeah. if you can, because we know times are tough, um, but if you can, starsinthehouse.com, um, or you can text fund 2020 to 56512, and then you'll get a receipt from the Actors Fund. You can forward that to donations at starsinthehouse.com. And, and then we will forward a donation and we'll read it out loud uh, on the air, like the Jerry Lewis telephone. So for the donations, to donations at starsinthehouse.com. By the way, we want to get this over with because we always forget we're going to be showing a video later. We want to thank Shelby Rassler. Yes. Her. She edits all of our amazing videos. Every, every time, like when we did like the Lay Miz one and when we did um, Betty Buckley. Yes, the, yes. Singing and on Carrie. Lindsay. And tonight we have one coming up that Kenita's doing, but Shelby Rassler does all of our amazing videos. So we really want to thank her for doing all She's that work. She's so great. But the, the, the money raised, we have our new total. We are up to... Four hundred and forty-five thousand nine hundred and five dollars raised for the actors. How much? Four hundred and forty-five thousand wow. nine hundred and five dollars. So close to four fifty, man. We'll get there. Um, okay, so tonight is the DNC, so we've got to make sure we don't uh, run over. So I'm going to talk. I'm actually going to talk fast tonight. Normally I'm super slow. <laughs> that, was, that was for my the regular audience out there. Um, we've got an incredible, incredible um, composing team here. Oh, hold on, you know, um, well, what am I forgetting? David is saying that our sync is really bad. Our sync, is... our sync is always horrific these days. I know we Wait, our sync is bad. Are you sure he's saying that? Yes, I, was saying yes that I am. Lynn's was horrible. So I, while you're bringing people up, I'm going to do our good old timey team viewer uh, here. I know. Team viewer is this thing where our tech person, David, can actually come on our computer and fix it. And we can't see anything, but we sort of because the whole <laughs> screen gets taken up with them fixing it. But we pretend we're looking at the people. Our screen is basically. Oh, we can hear. We'll, we'll be like the serious XM people, and uh, I'm literally taking a picture because this is how we work here. We're okay. we're a, we're a limited crew, and why are we? Because we can send every penny raised to the Actors Fund. Yeah, but not one of those like 20% is right. skimmed off the top. No, all the money <laughs> That's raised. That's right. So um, we're gonna send this to David. You bring on our guests. Wait, someone is watching in Osaka? Or are they just asking this question? What time is it in Japan, Osaka? Is that just a random question? Or did someone just say they're in, you guys, wait a minute, you guys are getting so professional? We are? We are? <laughs> we're nightmares. <laughs> all right, um, we have an incredible composing team. We've got a live surprise performance at the end. So please welcome to the stage and by stage online, the wonderful Flaherty and Aaron's. Here is Stephen Flaherty. Hi, Stephen. Hey, hi, how are you guys? Great to see you. Great to see Thank you. I love having you as a guest. I am so impressed with your tech savvy. You are? <laughs> I, I am. I mean, just to like try to figure out how to do a Zoom call has been challenging. Um, <laughs> and okay. then, you know, yeah. months into this, so, you know. We're pretty brutal. Uh, now I'm gonna welcome your amazing writing partner, her name is Lynn Ahrens. Wait, get off my team viewer, David. Let me click. <laughs> Lynn Ahrens. Hi, Lynn. Yeah. Hi. Hi, guys. How are you? How are you? We're good. People don't know. Steve writes the music. Lynn writes the lyrics. 
Um, when hold on, the last time we saw you, Lynn, was at the last show that we did in in uh, in a theater, and that was right. for the voices for the voiceless for you got to believe, and you were there because there was not one, not two, but three. Aaron Simplarity songs, right? Yeah, we raised money for You Gotta Believe, which helps older foster kids find homes. In that particular show, three songs happened to, like we did um, Funny Slash the Duck Joke, Santino Fontana and Andrea Martin. Right. We did Journey to the Past, I think? We did. Um, I, um, you did. She sang that wonderful girl at the end. Um, I've forgotten her name. Oh. Oh my God, of can, course. Tanika Gibson, Tanika Gibson sang, and Brian Stokes Mitchell sang Wheels of a Dream. 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 Oh, wow. Amazing. Yeah. That was a beautiful evening, you guys. It was so moving to meet your daughter. And, you know, it's just great. It was just great. Ah, it meant funny. so much to us that you were, were there. Yeah, it was so cool to have you there. Um, <laughs> it seemed clear I'm glad you weren't there because I had to record a track today for our last song. And I literally did it six times because I'm like, he's going to know you that. Really? Yeah, because I kept being like, I was scared. Because, you know, there were so many 16th notes. And I would once in a while skip a note. I'm like, Lynn's. I literally was like, Stephen's gonna hear every mistake I made. Whereas when Lynn was there, I wasn't singing lyrics, so I wasn't panicked. Yeah, but Stephen, I, Stephen, I finally had to go upstairs because I'm like, oh my gosh, she's gonna play it one time. It's like an earwig in his gut. <laughs> Your piano <laughs> there's not that many sharps and flats in that song, though. Come on. I know, but it's a lot of like, it's so many 16th notes cut. Okay, I think I had a back. lot of caffeine that day. I think there's a lot of ca caffeine. Well, I that's what I want to, by the way, say for everyone watching out there. Because I have worked with certain Broadway composers who literally whistle their melody into a tape recorder and then someone else arranges it, meaning writes on the melody and writes the chord. It's not called being a composer. Steven, you are like uber composer because you not only write all the music, you also like do the vocal arrangements, right? I do the vocal arrangements. I like do doodles in the margins. I'm like full service composer, <laughs> but I, I I love that because I think the more that I can give of myself to a project, you know, the the more of me is in there. So I love it. I, have a, I have a question. How did you two meet? Yeah, we met cute. We met in the BMI <laughs> workshop, <laughs> and um, we were both there in 1982, and. Um, Stephen never talked to anybody. He was very shy. He just yeah. ran in class, played brilliant music, and wrote his own lyrics, and then would leave. And I was writing lyrics, and you know, up until that point, I had written music. But um, I decided that I, I five chords does not a theater composer make. So I, you know, so I, I started sleeping around with different composers in the class, hearing Stephen <laughs> from afar. You know. And um, at the end of the year, the very end of the year, there was one more uh, assignment to, to um, be done. And I was standing outside on the sidewalk talking to a few composers and Steve Flaherty went running up 57th Street, just running. And he got about almost to 8th Avenue and he turned around and he went, hey, Lynn, you want to write a song? And <laughs> it was, it, he, he invited me. So that's how we met. I was shocked. I said, oh. Oh, people on dates too. I mean, it's like, you know, you realize that this is a moment and if you go and if I crossed 8th Avenue, the moment would be gone. So yeah. I, I, I hadn't really collaborated that much. And, you know, we came from different worlds, but I thought it could be really fun. And it was the last assignment. And, and yeah. here we are all these years later after, you know, it was the first song writing. I can't say it was a great song or even a good song, but it was a fun song to write. And we just really enjoyed one another's way of thinking. We were very different. Yeah, Wait a minute, Stephen. So you left the workshop not having picked yet who you'd be teaming up with. You were just like, what were you thinking when you left? Did oh, you oh no, no, this was at the end of the first year. We we had we were in there like what another two years. Yeah, oh. maybe yeah. more. Yeah, I think I think three years and all. But did you know Lynn's work from before the workshop? Did you know her Schoolhouse Rock stuff? I knew them from from Saturday morning. <laughs> but I, I didn't really no. know or the oud. You thought oud was there? It was. It, it was it, it's, when you think about it, though, you're you're working in a very short form, and you have to be so economical to get so much across in such a limited amount of time. And I think that that's, that's really served Lynn well. You know, putting well, like, you know, information in a very brief amount of time. You mean Schoolhouse Rock? Because they'd have to teach so much with it. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. You know, it's funny too because um, you know I did I did write all the the music for the ones that I did, um, and I literally knew five chords that I played on the guitar, and that's what I knew. And um, 
you know, Stephen, as you have seen, Seth, you know, there's lots of everything's written out. Everything's very composed and very, very um, educated. And I am just a, you know, bang on the keys improviser kind of a person. And I think that that's one of the reasons that, you know, we get along so well is because I sort of say, oh, just Stephen said that the first time we sat down, he said, just write something. This is true. She said, just make something up. And yeah. I had never written that way before you know i was like a, from the classical world and i would like you know dress like a monk in a dark little place and you know write everything through the night on paper you know we had paper back then and uh and lynn would say in a room in real time just make something out but i felt like Woo -hoo. you know it felt it was a very different way of working so i think it i think we it took us a while to just bridge our different ways of working to find a common way which was which was part of the challenge and part of the fun it's very Paula Abdul opposites attract. Very yes. nice. Very <laughs> nice. I'm a morning person, you're a night person, you know, all of that. You know. But by the time you left the workshop, did you know that, yes, the two of us can write a Broadway musical together? Like, Well, we, we, uh, we the first first score that we wrote, there were people that wanted to produce it. It was, it was a musical adaptation of the film Bedazzled with uh, Dudley, Dudley Moore and Peter Cook, and we could never seem to get the rights, but we had a full score that we had completed. And it was the old thing where somebody says, hey kid, I like that song, you got some more? And it would be like, as a matter of fact, I do. And you know, we <laughs> we had, you know, we had songs and that was sort of our calling card. But after yeah. writing that piece, I thought, I thought we have a really interesting common voice, I think. Mm -hmm. And uh, at, at first we did nothing but comedies and then we did more serious pieces and, you know, uh, I Lynn taught me to have faith, and I'm not talking about like you know Jesus faith, but I'm talking about the idea that there can be more great ideas where mm -hmm. the first one comes from. Yeah. And that I used to worry that like at measure 16, if I make choice A, it'll take me down in one road, and if I make choice B, it'll take me down the other road. And which is the right road? And I would tend to freeze up. And Lynn said, "Well, just make a choice, and you'll get down that road, and you'll find out soon enough that that was the right road." Mm -hmm. And just the idea of of just trying different approaches, trying different things, uh, and it's really about rewriting. You know, I would always try to get everything right on the first draft, and I've like learned over the years to give that up. That's really about the rewriting. Lynn, did did you by having not having to focus on the music and the lyrics, and just working on the lyrics, did it free you up in a way? How did that change you as a writer? Oh, it don't, totally freed me up. I mean, you know, it's sad because I own two pianos, one where I am, and my and, and I haven't used them for twenty five years. You know, Stephen, <laughs> but I don't know in tune. <laughs> they're never in tune. Yeah, no. I'm like, oh, we are terrible about that. You know, I'm like mother in ragtime. But um, <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, it freed me up a lot. And I and the the good thing is that Stephen is very. You know, I have a lot of musical sense and I have a lot of knowledge actually and, and, and musicality. So I'm able to, you know, make suggestions and stuff, but you know, a little bit, I think it was some singer, I think it was Laura Nairo or somebody who would say, I need more lavender from the band, you know, and nobody they would know what she was talking about. I'm a little like that, yeah. you know? but I can say if we're sitting in a, um, like an orchestra rehearsal. So I sit here, Steven sits next to me and the orchestrator sits on his left and I'll say, you know, I don't think that that feels like she would be doing that at this moment because, you know, she's in a funk and it really sounds a little too cheery. And Stephen turns to the orchestrator and says, make the B sharp, a B flat, and make the measure three of this and that. And I don't know what he's talking about, but, you know, it always seems to work. <laughs> well, I mean, Lynn has wonderful musical instincts and she has great ears and she has like the most killer sense of tempo. It's a little scary. You know, she knows that something is one, two, five versus one, two, four, or one, two, six. And, you know, uh, well, but that's part of that's part of what we do you know i was talking to a choreographer a friend of mine the other day and i said do you realize all of us in the theater we speak in completely different languages i said your sense of counts mm -hmm. and time are totally different than mine and totally different from the director and then whenever you're working in film it becomes seconds and it becomes frames and uh you know i think that's part of the fun and part of the challenge because this uh musical theater especially is like the most collaborative uh, field that I can think of and just to find ways to communicate with others and uh, to de decipher what Lynn is feeling and try to put that into musical terms. I think that's a lot of what it's all about, you know, because her instincts are spot on. 
Everything you're saying is so inspirational. And just by the way, Lynn, changing a B sharp to a B flat is a really big change. So I'm just curious if that ever actually happened. That just decided. Black well, dots to me, Seth. It's just a bunch of little black dots. I don't know. Holy oh, yeah. cow. But by the way, when I was mentioning Schoolhouse Rock, I just want people to know I don't think people really realize that that was you. You wrote the music and the lyrics, and you also sang. Did you, yeah. want, to be, did you want to be a musical theater performer? Did you want to be a musical theater performer? Because your voice is so great. No, I never want to be a performer. Steven knows. I just, if there's a light and a camera, I run. This is difficult for me right now. Also, I'm pretending I'm in your living room. It's actually not you. It's a, it's a puppet or like an animatronic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. you know, yeah. It's, I never, never, never want to be a performer. And when people say, come on the show and sing, Steven knows. I'm like, no. You know? I remember those first couple of times we had to do public appearances, like sing a number or something in a uh, club or whatever. And Lynn would, she'd hyperventilate, you know, that was not your favorite thing. I yeah. would hyperventilate. But, but you know, when, when I did Schoolhouse Rock and I did a lot of jingles in the past too, you're, you're, in, you're with a bunch of friends around a microphone in a studio. You're not performing exactly. It's just your, you know, so it's, it's low pressure and it's, it's very different. And I love that. That was fun. Anybody who grew up in the 70s will know you from this amazingness. We the people, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare at hand, secure the blessings of liberty. To ourselves and our posterity do ordain and establish this constitution for the United States of America. You know, oh my there you God. Go. go and vote, everybody. You see the little ballot box? I mean, how vote. much more can we say? You know, I mean, perfect that you ran that on this evening. You know, the, the last perfect. Day, the convention perfect. was perfect. If I ever if I never wrote another thing, I would be happy I wrote that at, at this moment in time. So great. But by the way, on a side note, you keep saying you only knew three chords, but um, um, um <laughs> like that's a, in Interplanet Janet, that's a real shocking chord that comes in. That's not one of your signature four chords, that's a great chord. Well, my finger might have landed on something that I wasn't expecting, and I just <laughs> had to repeat it. I don't know. Well, I want people to hear it. It's so shocking. It's so great. I Uh, you know, I think I'm singing it down the octave now. <laughs> <laughs> I really do. Angel Black, she is key. She is key now. I mean, she is key. Right. So, Stephen, I want to talk for a second because I always, I'm always praising Stephen because of all the different styles. Because you have like, you know, um, like. <laughs> But then you have, I mean, you do every single style. Have you always wanted to do every single style? I, well, I, I should tell you like a quick little anecdote. Uh, the very first musical that I ever wrote was uh, when I was 14 and it was at South House Catholic High School. I have to do a shout out because I think some of my friends from, from the school are watching tonight. And uh, every, it was about Pittsburgh, which where I'm from. And so every musical number was written in a different musical style and a different color of ink. So every, there was a, a country Western number, there was a show tune, there was a rock and roll song. Uh, of course, it ended with a big gospel finale, you know, uh, and I was always interested in genre and also trying to find myself in different styles and to adapt them through my sensibility. And that was like a really early thing for me, you know? So uh, I think I think younger people, they should just be encouraged to listen to all different kinds of music and uh, just appreciate all of these different worlds. And, you know, yeah. So that's always been some crazy interest of mine, you know? And I've no one ever, no one ever said you have to write this way. No one ever like busted you. Like you've got to find a style and stick to it. No, well, my my uh, first composition slash piano teacher, Bill Crystal in, from Pittsburgh, he said to me, no one will take you seriously if you write in colored ink. Do you think Sondheim writes in colored ink? And I 
met him years later, I should have asked that. You know, I didn't. <laughs> I didn't. Uh, but no, nobody said it's it, it 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 all comes from character and it comes from the world. You know, and that sort of dictates the musical style and you know what it wants to be. So in terms of Bedazzled, I know you're still waiting for the rights. So what was your first what was your first hit? Was it Lucky Stiff? Um, we, no, well, we did one show before Lucky Stiff, believe it or not. We wrote a uh, version of The Emperor's New Clothes that got produced by Theater Works USA and went on tour around the country. And that was our actually our first show. And it really taught us a lot because um, I learned on that show that uh, an audience of children is exactly the same as an audience of adults, only bigger and louder. So, you know, <laughs> they don't check their watches in their programs. They just get up and run up the aisle and throw pizza when they're, bigger, <laughs> you know what I mean? And you, right. learn a lot, you think, oh, we should cut this. <laughs> you know, they're not mm -hmm. doing it. So it, that, that was very informative. And then we did Lucky Stiff. Then that yeah. happened. Yeah. And that was off Broadway. That was Playwrights Horizons, right? Playwrights Horizons, yeah, yeah. 1988, believe yeah. it or not. Yeah. And it wound up, for people that don't know, it really launched a classic song that is always done. Here's Kathy McPhee doing it. The kind of eyes that welcome you the minute you walk in. A tender glance you simply can't refuse. At times like this, a girl could use A dog. She listens. Uh, Thank you. I, I oh love that. I've never seen that. I've never, I've never seen, seen that either. She wouldn't be sitting alone in a, in a nightclub in Monte Carlo, though. I'm sorry. Yes. Unnoticed. No. <laughs> It was taken taken out of the uh, the actual out script. Of context. <laughs> out of context. <laughs> so then after you did that, I mean, like, first of all, can you really, when you're doing a show, Playwrights Horizons, like, was that your living? Or did you guys have, were you like baristas during the day? Like, what oh, were you doing to make a living? Seth, Seth I would write by day. And, and Lynn and I were at that point very committed to uh, being collaborators, you know? And so I had to find whatever it took to keep me being able to write by day. And that actually meant nonsense. I played nonsense for years on the same block as Playwrights Horizons. We were on the Douglas Fairbanks right down right down the pike. And nonsense was unstoppable. And no matter, you could run it over with a truck and it would keep going, you know? And so I played nonsense for years and years and years. And that was my night gig. And uh, the fun thing is a lot of stars would come to see it. Like I got to meet Douglas Fairbanks Jr. himself you know, who came there and, uh, you know, uh, the professor and Marianne came one night in Lovey. It was like half the cast of Gilligan's Island one night, and uh, it was you know it was it was a great thing. It was like a gig in the theater, and and I uh, sub playing um, Forbidden Broadway for a while, and that was really fun. They I, I, they did two of job. our shows too. I was his day job, basically. Well, Lynn, how were you making money? Were you still working at the advertising agency? No, no, no. Uh, by that time, I was doing jingles. Um, and Schoolhouse Rock and Captain Kangaroo and you know I sort of but they were so freelancey you know I could I could really schedule around working with Stephen so yeah. it was it was a wonderful time you know so then what was the big break then Once on this Island I think yes Queen yeah. and, how, and how did that come about um, like, you know we did we did Lucky Stiff and I remember we got reviewed. And I remember I was shocked because they didn't like it very much. And I was like, how could that be? It's no, they, so, were, they were you know, called mixed. It, it never like, occurred to me. It never it was mixed. Me. Yeah, it was <laughs> so, but what they, what they said is like, these kids have talent. Let's see what they come up with next. And of course, right. you know, you know, I, I love this so much. So. And I and I was so shocked that you know, and we had nothing else to work on. And I I was um, you know like I just didn't know what had just hit me. I it had never occurred to me that I would ever get a, a mix, much less a bad review. You know, and <laughs> talk about you know a little confidence. That's why you're fearless. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't. It didn't occur to me. So I went uh, looking for the next idea, and I went to Barnes and Noble, which at the time had um, a whole big section of used books. And I started thumbing through all the used books crazily looking, you know, and I'd read, I'd only go for books 
that had a book jacket with a slight description of the plot. So I could kind of go, no, nope, not that, mm -hmm. no, not that. And then I found this little thin volume and I opened it up and the first lines were, there's an island where rivers run deep, where the sea mm -hmm. sparkling in the sun earns it the name Jewel of the Antilles. And I went, oh, and I closed the book. I bought it for $1.50 and I went home and I read it in like an hour because it's a really thin book. And I came up, went over to Stevens in a cab and I said, here's our next musical. I just knew it. So that's that was how it began. Because you would assume that it would be like like the musical genre dictating the text, and it was in, in fact the opposite. Yeah, but at that time, just for my own pleasure, I was listening to tons of world music. You know, a lot of South African music, a lot of uh, South American music, uh, music of the islands, and it had never occurred to me that I could potentially. Uh, it, it was basically a fable. It was in, in this first version. It was uh, sort of an uh, unnamed island. In the revival, we brought it more to Haiti. But there was something about uh, looking at these various cultures and creating uh, uh, a fable island uh, that had its own language, that had its own uh, vocabulary, uh, and that we that I could in, in some way find a way to use the world music uh, as a theater piece. So it took me a while to figure that out, but that was actually the fastest writing we've ever done in our lives. Yeah. We, we were first first draft from beginning to end in, in six months. Yeah. And three months and later, I think we were up. You know what, I'll, I'll just add one thing to that because you were saying to Stephen, oh, you have all these different styles and you can play all these different genres. And that has come in so amazingly, not handy is the wrong word, but you know, it's, it's such a wonderful thing because I love, different worlds, I like to explore cultures, I like to read books, I like to, you know, and I, we never repeat anything. And that's partly because Stephen can write in pretty much any style that there is, and we can channel these different worlds. So it's, it's really, it's a fun, um, fun partnership in that way. But I'll be dazzled. How did you get the rights to Once on this Island? You do have the rights, right? This is not some of the <laughs> We forgot to get the rights. Oh my God. <laughs> Yeah, no, we, we did. We did. We called up. Well, I I called the publisher of the book. I said, "Who's the agent for the author?" She gave me the agent's name. We got in touch with the agent and we made an offer, and um, we negotiated and and we kept writing this show. And it was the writing was very quick. It really was about six months from start to finish. Mm -hmm. But in the six month, we still hadn't gotten the rights. It was still being negotiated, and so then the agent said. Rosa Gee will have to hear this before she will give approval. And we went, oh my God, this is terrifying. So in walked Rosa Gee, who is this absolute queenly woman. She was tall and she was beautiful and she was very stern, very, very stern. And she sat down and she folded her arms and we had singers, we had Vivian Cherry, I think. I forget who yeah. that. Great it's singer. Fun, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah, and they sang and they sang, they sang their hearts out and I pitched the show to her and I had too much coffee and you know, it was just, I was like frantic that she wouldn't like it and she just sat there with her arms crossed and didn't have any reaction. And finally she said, we finished and we're sort of panting and you know, what do you think? And she went, well, and then she just paused and the pause was like about an hour long. She went, well, <laughs> it's, Wonderful, and I knew I thought I was going to pass out. And, <laughs> Me too. Yeah, I, I, and then without the rights, I she just kept us just reeling us in with three words. You know, <laughs> it's like unbelievable. Oh my gosh! Yeah. But it's, it, it was a beautiful experience. And uh, it was the first time we had worked with Graciela Danielle, who uh, directed, choreographed it. And we've worked with her many, many times since. And uh, she's just a special person, you know, and she really understood the world. And the, that original cast was fantastic. Yeah. I can't imagine uh, having birthed that show without that group of amazing actors. And they brought so much of their themselves to the piece and it was a, a fantastic experience where do you get like lynn where do you get you know the titles of your songs or the themes like where did you get the idea waiting for life to begin was that from the book or was that you channeling yourself as a teenager i think it was me channeling i never remember you know at a certain point it just becomes what it is but um i'm pretty sure i wrote that line <laughs> i don't think it was no it wasn't in the book that's my life it, yeah, it's not in the book. I think I just, um, you know, the, the, 
a lot of times music comes first in our collaboration, which I love. Yeah. And, um, I think, it, um, oh, Stephen, who said that quote that I'm always quoting? Oh, it was Marilyn Bergman. Yeah. Um, that the, the words are on the tips of the notes. And if I can get music first, I know what the song is going to be. Wow. So is that what happened with this? So he wrote, bum, 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 bum. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 and then you work bit by bit. I mean, Seth, for a while, uh, the song was out of the show. And Lynn says, this isn't working. We have to try another song. And in fact, it was a completely different bridge. And like the, the song was right, the title was right, the feel was right, the bridge was wrong. So we went, we tried a completely different uh, song and then came back to it, uh, rewrote the bridge and all of a sudden, uh, but what also had the part where she sings "We'll Drive" and you know, little Shans gets to hit that amazing yeah. note. And at that moment in time, the audience falls in love not only with the character but with that actor. And so once we put "We'll Drive" in in the song, uh, it worked, and it worked every night. And she's so ageless. Here she is. This is her doing the big song. This is back in the day in the Rosie O'Donnell show. Listen to this. <laughs> There, there you oh go. My God. And Seth, I know that you appreciate like uh, talking about vocal issues and technique. And LaShawn, I wrote the song in a certain key, and LaShawn said, "Can you take it and make it higher?" <laughs> and I'm like, "Are you crazy?" You know. And she says, "No, seriously, my voice." She said, "If it's just that much higher, I can pole vault." Was mm -hmm. the I can actually pole vault over and hit the note. And so we we raised up a whole step, and she is the only person that's ever sung it in that key. Everybody else sings it in the original key because it's you know, such an interesting place and she has that interesting thing that she does. She came in for an open call and that's how we found her. She did not have a, an audition booked. No. She came in on an open call and in this room wow. with people dancing and singing, maybe 50 people, there she was. We wow, just, oh, that's so inspirational wow. to the young actors out there that think there's no purpose to going to open calls. Oh, no, they should, they should. They, uh, yeah. at, that, at that point, she was she was really a dancer mostly. You know, she had, she was yeah. in town, in town, but she had never like had scene work or gotten a chance to sing solo. And you know, you just look at her and think she's perfect. You know, please Lord, let her sing. And she. <laughs> to the mat. It was almost like she was trained for the Olympics and she just studied uh, Haitian dance and worked on her voice and 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 she, her learning curve was like that. And you could, you, she was great to begin with, but this was like watching somebody become, you know, the star in the making in real time. And that was- You were there, man. Wow. Yeah, man. Two great. Right before we take our medical break, we're gonna take a medical break. First of all, our pal Ronnie, of course, knew exactly that clip. That was- Ronnie, hi, Ronnie. Hi, Ronnie. <laughs> You know, I was promoting the big Once in a Silent Reunion, which was incredible. I remember seeing that. And second of all, the only thing I'll say is that my sister is still mad at me because I got her tickets for Once in a Silent. I kind of told her it was a happy musical. And to this day, anytime I recommend something to her, she goes, does anybody turn into a tree? Because she's still devastated by the end. <laughs> <laughs> That's her code for is it a devastating ending? So she's just oh. That's, funny. That's funny. so mean. Uh, anyway, okay, so you guys can be back in two minutes. We're going to bring in our chief medical correspondent from CBS and also from Stars and House. Go take a bathroom break if you need Lynn and Steven's in a minute. <laughs> love I you guys. Love Dr. LaPook, what's up? Guys, I loved Steven's reference to Gilligan's Island, which, believe it or not, was the second reference to Gilligan's Island in the last 48 hours because somebody was, we were talking about anti science bias that's going on in, in the United States. And I was trying to come up with an analogy, and I said, look, if you're shipwrecked on Gilligan's Island, who do you want to be shipwrecked with, Thurston Howell III or the professor? You, you want the professor, okay? The professor's going to get you. Going to get you off the island, going to take a coconut, make a, you know, a, a flange out of it or whatever, you know, make a radio receiver or a transmitter. 
So um, yeah, anti-science bias, we're dealing with it right this very second. A third of the country is saying they're not going to take the vaccine, even if it's out. You know what? That's the kind of thing where I just go like, I'll cross that bridge when we get to it. Let's worry about the vaccine coming out before we estimate who's going to take it. I just feel like people say a lot of things. You know, I'll but you know sure. something, Seth, yeah. you know what? Normally I would say that too, but we have to get a, a, ahead of this. There's already a big vaccine hesitancy movement and we're not thinking about, there is a big problem with minorities, African-American, Latinx, uh, with- um, Fear? With with the with the um, I was going to say Native American and Pacific Islanders, they're not signing up for these trials in the in the amounts that they should. And there is a long history which we we talked about before about why there is some fear. But it's up to us to try to educate, get out there, not only public health figures but the community. Uh, and tomorrow morning, you're going to see a really cool story at 7:38 a.m. on CBS this morning. I worked on it for a number of days about, uh, phase, it's a good news story. It's about phase three of one of the new vaccines. And we will feature a, a doctor who's a family practitioner um, who's in Louisiana and she's African-American. She has a lot of patients in her practice who are African-American and Latinx. And she took the vaccine, not just to be part of the trial, but to be an example for yeah. her yeah. Uh, for her patients. So anyway, um, I'm uh, tomorrow morning. I think we're paying the price for the horrible things that happened from before. It's unfortunate. It's like because Tuskegee, all that horrible stuff that happened has made this, these communities so distressful. It's, oh, it's very upsetting. So, I mean, how can we sort of counter that? It's just have people of color in the medical field really confirm. Well, you know, Francis Collins is the head of the NIH. I was speaking to him a couple of days ago, and he said, boy, wouldn't it be great? I mean, he said to me, wouldn't it be great if somebody who is prominent, who's African-American or Latinx, went out there and publicly said, I'm going to be taking part of, um, you know, in these studies. But, uh, you know, it's important to have representation because these populations are disproportionately affected. Yeah. And so yeah. we have to we have to have them represent these trials. I just think it's education, empathy, and also, and I'll end with this, belief. Um, you have to remember that people who are anti-vaccine or who are vaccine hesitant, it's often based on belief. And you can't just laugh off belief, right? Um, I've used as an example when my son Noah was little, four or five, he finally insisted that we tell him whether or not there was a tooth fairy. I'm sorry if there's anybody out there who's under the age of uh, 10, please turn off. Go like this. La, 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 la. So he insisted. We finally told him the truth. He, he had one of the great crying fits. He was on his stomach. He was going like this, right? You know, the, you know and at the end, he was finally calming down. You know the end of a, of a real tantrum where you're going, hah, 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 that, that part? Daniel, who's about four years older than him, rubbing his shoulder very gently and says, Noah, I know exactly how you feel. I felt the same way when I found out there was no Easter bunny. There's no Easter bunny! Back on the ground. <laughs> so, his belief was punctured. And we have to remember what it feels like to have belief punctured. So I think we have to have empathy for people who were explaining this to. We can't yeah. just say, oh, snap out of it. We have to explain it to them. Uh, I keep, uh, by the way, my dog is so many allergies right now that I keep looking at. I'm not ignoring you, but she's just gnawing at her paws. Um, Dr. LeBrook, amazing having you here as usual. We're going to be back tomorrow, right? Not, not tomorrow, because um, we have no show tomorrow, because newsies, we're directing everyone to watch Newsies, because that's for the Actors Fund, and that's tomorrow at 8 o'clock at Playbill. On Playbill. But we'll be back on Saturday, because we're going to have the cast of Revival of Pippin here. Wow, okay. So I'll be on the road. We're going to Maine with a little family vacation. Very but good. I'll dial in with my uh, little communicator. And okay. uh, so I'll, I'll, we'll give you a little travel, like, a little travel log. I love, I love it. that. Okay. All right. All right. All right, that's the poke. Bye. Come on, my poor dog here. You bring them on. I was just talking well, to Well, I'll, I'll get Mandy. You, you bring everyone on. Okay, poor Mandy. Poor little Mandy. She's so many allergies. She's biting her nails like crazy. All right, Mr. Flaherty, Ms. Aaron. Hi, Hi guys. Um, yes, my sister is commenting in the comments about the tree. She's still devastated over that. Why, by the way, why, Aaron's, why couldn't you make the ending? By the way, this is my sister. Hashtag. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> no turning into a tree. <laughs> Why could the any be they wind up living happily ever after like we all wanted? No, it can't be. 
It cannot be. I don't know why. It didn't. Well, well, it, the, the original the original ending is is so tragic. And oh. this this sort of went to the this sort of went we went back to the original Hans Christian Andersen story where there's a miracle in the final moments of that particular story. We thought that we needed a miracle ending and it's much more uplifting. So your sister should not read that book. If she was oh, don't, don't read the book. She should um, not read the original. It's really grim. But um, you know, I think we just we were wanted to honor the book. What she does is more important than marry him. It's it's that she heals, you know, the rift in in between the, the classes and she sets her 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 um, ancestors free to love. And that's that's our ending. Sometimes you can have both though. You don't have to choose one, but we'll discuss it for the second revival that happens in 10 years. <laughs> okay, so, <laughs> thank you. so I wanna talk about this film song that we're gonna be able to show. T talk oh, yeah. to me about the song that Kanita sang. What is it? Give me all the details. Yeah. Um, go ahead, Stephen. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, we, we were uh, invited to uh, be part of a documentary called After the Storm, and, and it was made uh, by a very talented uh, director writer named uh, Hila Medalia in 2009. And it's about a group of kids in uh, post Katrina New Orleans uh, presenting Once on This Island. And it's about the community healing itself. And they had photo, uh, what, what do you call those? Like sort of video journals. They're vlogging. You know, vlogging. Right. Yes, they vlogged, exactly. and and uh, she, uh, I, I got to write the score for it. And she said, "Would you and Lynn be interested in writing uh, a song for the movie that we think might be over the end titles?" And uh, I, I guess it had been so much enough time had passed, and I thought, you know, this is a really interesting way that we could interface with the show that we had created so many years earlier, and also to. Uh, to do something to help uh, raise uh, money for this particular uh, arts centered uh, in in uh, New Orleans, and it, it seemed like a really cool thing to do, and also to find ways to take some of the themes of once on this island and make them uh, fresh and contemporary. And I'll just, I'll just add to that: the, the director of the show of, of Once on This Island, not of the movie, but of the production of Once on This Island that the kids are doing, it was Jerry McIntyre who That's was right. in the original cast of Once on this Island, uh, old friend of ours. And, um, you know, did a beautiful job. And, and then they ended up bringing the kids to New York. It was it was a wonderful, yeah. wonderful um, event. The whole thing was just great. The so documentary, it's, it's still out there, right? We can still see the documentary after the storm? Yeah. 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 You can stream it. Yeah. yeah. It's really a great film. It's, it's a beautiful. It's really, it's yeah. really lovely. And um, it's it's very emotional, and it's about the the kids just trying to find their way back to normalcy. So uh, we actually thought it was considering our current uh, situ situation. You know, we thought it, it's about us trying to find our way back into the world too. So this is this was recorded just for this show right now. This is Kanita, who, by the way, was in the revival of Once in a yes. Right, Kanita Miller, Miller, who played uh, Mama Yearly in this revival. And this was just recorded and Shelby Rassler did the editing. Here we go. Hit it. Life is a why. Pain is a why. Love is a why. Grief is why. Hope is a why. Faith is a why. You are wise. I never knew what we could do together. I think of you and I could smile forever. You pulled me through after the storm. Mm -hmm. My world was gone. What can a heart believe in? You move beyond, now I can see that even the birds will sing after the storm. Mm -hmm. Just when you can't go on's when you've got to learn to. Just when you're sinking down's when you've got to swim. Hope is the only home we can all return to. Let your hope bring you home again. Tears gonna dry and doors gonna fly wide open 
sky's gonna clear and time's gonna make you strong. We have the kind of hearts that cannot be broken. We're all alone and frightened, but life goes on. Look how the sky is brightened. We are the song after the storm. Oh, yeah. Now, you and I, we got a new sun rising. Like birds that fly, I see a new horizon. And love is away. When you can't go on is when you've got to learn to Just when you're sinking down is when you've got to swim Hope is the only home we can all return to Let your hope bring you home again Tears gonna dry and doors gonna plow out open Sky's gonna clear and time's gonna make you strong we have a kind of past that cannot be broken after, after the storm. is why faith is why you are why mm -hmm. Wow. Oh, boy. That's unbelievable. She's like the essence of music. I, 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 I adore her more than virtually anybody. She she brings so much heart and commitment and soul and joy to everything she does. And she's wonderful. Yeah. She's been in a ton of our we've been like, We've done like maybe four or five shows with her. It's been, we may have given her her equity card. I think she had just graduated, graduated from Eastman. And uh, played Sarah in the uh, one of the national oh, tours, yeah. and opposite Quentin Darrington, who was also in Once on this Island. Yes, she was yeah. excellent. Oh wow! By the way, we're doing donations. I wanted to just read some of the donations for you guys. We have fan Isabel from Germany. Someone from Germany is watching wow. right now. That's nice. Fifty bucks. Thank you, Isabel. Mark from Massachusetts. Twenty-five bucks for the Actors Fund. Ragtime is my favorite show. Almost every song is an eleven o'clock number. <laughs> I'm grateful to you for years of joy. That's true. That's lovely. Nicole from Florida, ten bucks. My favorite collaborators. Obsessed with Marie dancing still and all your work. We're gonna talk about Marie soon. Yeah, Aaron from Boston, a hundred dollars for the Actors Fund. This is my sixth time donating to Stars in the House. I love Aaron's and Flaherty so much. I always tell my friends, Ragtime is the American Les Mis, an epic made up of intertwining stories of characters across the social spectrum, told in a uniquely American idiom that makes you laugh, cry, and understand something about being human and being American. Every time there's a production, I go, no matter where it is. Oh, um, yeah. that's nice. Thank you. That's so much better than I ever could. Thank you. 
<laughs> I bet that. We'll talk about Marie because it's that's what's so wonderful. You know, so many collaborators do three amazing shows and then they decide to collaborate with other people. It's so annoying. I love that you guys <laughs> keep doing shows. Right? It's so great for us fans. But what, what is Marie? What's it about? It's about the salad dressing, Marie's. Anybody made that joke yet? No. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great no. idea, you know, so. Should Thank put you. that on the list. The salad dressing magnate. No, what is it actually about? So here's what it's actually about. If, if I'm sure that somewhere along the way in your lives, you have seen the sculpture that Edward, Edgar Degas made of the little dancer. It's a little ballerina, it's sort of three quarters, real life size. It's in a number of different, you know, bronzes of it are in different museums and she's wearing her little tutu. Yes, she's in fourth position with her hands behind her back and she's this little scrappy urchin. And I've seen it a million times and every time I see it, I think, who is the girl? Who is that girl who posed for that? You know, I, it's a beautiful sculpture, but I started to get sort of obsessed with who the girl was. And I started doing research and there's quite a bit known about her. Um, her name was Marie von Goethem. She danced with the Paris Opera Ballet uh, as a young girl. She was one of the little rats, they called them, uh, who were the youngest of the dancers. Um, she had, her mother was a washwoman. Her uh, older sister was a courtesan who went to jail eventually. She was kind of a prostitute. Her younger sister was, uh, grew up to be a very well-known dancer. And Marie, uh, by one coincidence and another, ended up posing for this sculpture for a famous artist. And he created an absolute masterpiece at the time that he was going blind. He started using his hands. Oh and she, this little kid in, inspired a masterpiece. And, and nobody knows what actually happened to her, which is the amazing thing. She was dismissed from the ballet. She got fired. And she vanished into the slums of Paris. And no one knows what happened to her. So we have created, out of the facts of her life, we have created an amazing story. I just have to say it. It's like, I think it's one of the best things we've ever done. I think it's- Oh my gosh. Very it's very amazing. And also it's an original. Lynn has written book and lyrics uh, based on an original idea. And uh, it, it's been, it's been so, oh, and we're also collaborating on it with Susan Stroman. You have to say that. Yeah. So, yeah. And, and she's, been, she's been so ins inspiring and uh, the cast, uh, we, we got uh, the opportunity to do it at the Kennedy Center. And then last season uh, we did it uh, at the Seattle Fifth Avenue and uh, we're, we're, ready for Broadway. So we have yeah. some preachers now. The, biggest, so we'll news the, show, the we'll, biggest news of the show is that we have the greatest ballerina in America as our star, Tyler Peck, who is uh, an extraordinary dancer. She's prima ballerina in New York City Ballet. Um, and she embodies the role. She dances like you can't believe. She, it's a rock, she's a rock star of the ballet world. And when she finishes at the end of the show, the audience is screaming and standing and they will not leave theater it's it's stunning so we're very excited and you know once the real theater comes back and people can sit in those chairs you yeah. know uh, we will we will do the show yeah uh, well let me show the scissor reels this will get you guys excited about the quarantine being over one day and we're going to get mm -hmm. to see the show on the broadway on the broadway So that's wow. what's going to crescendo, right? Oh, yeah. it's it's Terrence Mann is Degas, by the way, who's fabulous. Oh, yeah. Terrence Mann. Terrence and we have such a you can see them go by, you know, Louise Petra, uh, She's fabulous. Lee Hope, Terrence Ziemba, Kyle Harris, uh, Terrence Mann, you know, the whole gang is just stunning. Jenny Powers, 
you know. Oh, I love Jenny Powers. She's um, great. So listen, we want to do like a whole, I feel like we have to do a whole once in a silent reunion and a whole ragtime reunion. I feel like we need like an Anastasia reunion. A proper reunion. amount of time. Yeah, because sort of, this was just sort of a smattering of Flaherty and Aaron's. So we want to close this. <laughs> and a way to trick you, Lynn, to, to be able to come on the show and, and uh, try to get you here another four or five times. Yeah. Welcome. <laughs> okay. So we want to bring on the amazing um, Cole House, who I got to do with on Broadway, and he began in the Toronto company replacing Stokes, and he was just on our show just a couple weeks ago. Please welcome the amazing Alton Fitzgerald <laughs> White. Hi. Hey there. How are you? There he is. Hey. Hey, Alton. <laughs> hey there. So How what was it like, the Flaherty and Aaron, do you remember Alton coming in? And I mean, he was oh, like yeah. basically the second Cole House ever. Like, what was it like? Why did you guys cast him? Like, what was it like? Talk about it. Because he was fantastic, you know? And, uh, <laughs> you know, Stokes opened the show and then Alton took over and I think he did the role more than a year. Just about right? a year, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, he's, yeah. he's so powerful and he's, he's amazing. Thank you, know? you. And he's from Cincinnati, Ohio too. So yes. what's not to like about that? <laughs> I, I, remember, I remember. <laughs> you know, ice cream. You know Steven. You know what's up. I, Alton, I do remember when you came into the show because it was, you know, such a different energy and so equally gorgeous and powerful. You know, he's this powerful man with muscles. And I remember getting ready to grab and went, oh my God. And, you know, it was, you were, you were coming in that role. Really. Amazing. Wonderful. One of my all time favorites. Yeah. And didn't you add some extra sassy dancing, Alton? I did. Um, Graciela <laughs> gave me my own choreography because I was more had more of a dance background, so I got to really kind of cut loose and get ready. Wow. It was fun. It's a lot of fun. And Batmont. Um, okay, so <laughs> we're do one of the big songs. Well, we you're gonna do one of the big songs from Rackham. Your microphone sounds super soft, Alton, but I'm gonna assume that it's not. How about now? Still better. Yeah, okay. I guess I'd like, bring your mug closer. Yeah. Okay, so this is this is one of the many eleven o'clock numbers from Ragtime, according to the donation. Basically, <laughs> it's true. This, this is the eleven o'clock number, and Alan's gonna recreate his uh, Toronto Broadway performance. Okay, I'm gonna take myself out, and Alan, you can go. To okay. Let it echo far and wide, make through here, make through here. How justice was our battle, and how justice was denied, make through here, make through here. And say to those who blame us for the way we chose to fight. And sometimes there are battles that are more than black or white. And I could not put down my sword when justice was my right. Make them king. Oh, I'll tell our story to your daughters and your sons. Make them king. Make them king. And tell them in our struggle we were not the only Make them hear, make them hear. Your sword can be a sermon for the power of the pen. Teach every child to raise his voice, and then my brother said, Will justice be demanded by two million righteous men? Make them hear when they hear. That was so incredibly beautiful. Thank you. Thank, Thank you for that. You are in such amazing voice. Thank you. Uh, just 20 years later, I mean, come on. Thank, you. Thank you so much. It was, was amazing. It's an honor to sing that song. It's always an honor to sing anything that the two of you wrote. You're two of my absolute favorites. You know that. Well, well ditto. Well, what a and gift. I saw, I, I saw the original Once in This Island on Broadway 13 times. <laughs> <laughs> my favorite Broadway show of all time. 
Didn't you do your laundry? Like you go put your laundry yeah, in the walking I, 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 I had Sunday off. I would do yeah. laundry, go to brunch, see once yeah. on the island, have my evening. It was like my on part of my schedule. Yeah, I remember that. I love that. <laughs> did, that, did that make you a little bit more nervous when you went and auditioned for Ragtime because you're already a big fan of theirs? Uh, well, you know, actually, Ragtime the movie is what made me want to be in the business. So between, I remember from your book. Between knowing that, like, oh, my God, they're making a musical and getting to meet two of my <laughs> rock star composers, uh, I was just, like, I was just grateful to be in the room. Wow. Yeah. Well, let me so ask you something. That so, cast was so yeah. They were amazing, that whole cast. Yeah. Was a dream. Yeah. Let me ask Stephen and Lynn, like, you know, when you're writing that song, I make them hear you. So did you write, like, the tag, Stephen? And then Lynn, you're like, oh, my God, I have a perfect rhyme for it? Like, uh, I, 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 I believe that was a music first. I think so. I don't really remember that. We, 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 knew, we knew that this was the crucial moment in the show where it's almost like in a Western where uh, the hero of the story is going out to meet, you know, his fate and it's this last moment and it has to explain who he's about in his heart. And I believe that was a, a music, a music first. And, mm -hmm. and then we knew that there would be, here's the repeated part. Here's the, you know, which became make them hear you. And uh, the interesting thing is that they, the, the words make them hear you are said throughout the lyric quite a few times. And it's it's really interesting how different actors energize that that those four words. And, and it actually it's it's been sung a lot, you know, with the Black Lives Matter movement and with what's happening now and people recording it in their uh, bedrooms and whatever and choral versions and it's 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 really become larger than the show. And it's it's, just, it's very moving to see how people connect to it. You know, it's, it's really interesting because when we first did Ragtime, I thought of it, I think most people thought of it as a period piece. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, it, and it was sort of like, look how much better we are than, than we were then. And now that the show, you know, is, is being sort of bubbling up into this moment in time, mm -hmm. it, it has changed out of all recognition in terms of, it seems so contemporary, and so relevant. And it, it seems to be saying, look how far we still have to go. Yes. You know, I mean, it's it's, it's of, canny. One of the Last best things that goes, yeah. Me too, and immigration, and you know, just everything we all care about. And there it is, yeah. and it started 25 years ago, I and mean, it's amazing. Oh, it's an incredible, be really one of the best musicals of the 20th century. Well, we'll um, have you back to talk more about yeah, it. Yeah, we're going to do because, as one of our viewers is saying, the convention is starting. So we're going to work out. Much more important. Much more important. We're going to yeah, go. We're going to go listen. And vote for it, right? Alton, you're amazing. We're going to show our closing credits. So I'll, I'll try to play what I remember of your opening song. See if I still have All right. Uh, Bye, everyone. Have a good night. Bye, everybody. Bye, everybody. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thanks for joining Bye. us. Bye. Thank you.